Okay, so thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm Stepanichev Zoran. Uh, I'm working for Get Your Guide. I've been working as a software engineer for quite a while, and early on I was thrown into the world of Oracle and databases, and for the last four years I've been a BI engineer with Get Your Guide. Uh, and we're going to start with a few words about Get Your Guide today, and then we're going to jump into the funnels uh, with a short introduction, uh, like what we wanted to achieve, and then we're going to do a deep dive with some code samples, uh, and we're going to show about some of the things we plan to do in the future, and how to extend the solution, and we're going to show how it looks currently for our end users when they want to use it. Uh, so, uh, the Get Your Guide is one of the leading online uh, business to customer platforms for booking incredible experiences like all of the tour activities, or, uh, like walking tours and tickets to uh, famous sites like Eiffel Tower and the like. And since we all like the numbers, we have customers from more than 150 uh, countries. We have around, well, actually more than 50,000 products available for uh, more than 150 countries. And we have sold quite a few tickets, more than 25 million. Uh, we have also gathered some money along the way. Uh, we, we received recently a huge funding. Uh, and I have more than 600 colleagues uh, around the world. And let, let's jump into the funnels. Um, so this would be like the two common ways to visualize the funnels. Uh, and we're going to show how we did that. So first, let's start with the requirements we had from our business on the solution. So since we're using uh, Looker as our BI tool, we wanted to use it as a front end from, for the funnel analysis. Uh, and we're using Databricks. So naturally, we chose Spark to be the backend, uh, and our Looker is directly connected to our um, Databricks instance. And as for the results of the analysis, we have to respect the order of the events. We don't want that the second step has more visitors than the first step, or something like that. And anything can happen between the any two steps of the funnel, and any step of the funnel can actually contain multiple events. So we have to give kind of a freedom to our end users to pick whatever they want for each step. And we need to support uh, funnel-wide and step-specific uh, filters, which I'm going to show later. And we want our sessions to be based on touch points. Uh, and later I will explain like, what are touch points for us uh, and why we only use them in some cases, not always. And as for performance, we would like to kind of analyze the four weeks of data in under 60 seconds, ideally under 30 seconds. Uh, but that heavily depends on the size of your cluster and the volume of your data. And of course, as life usually is, somebody wants to also to ignore the order of events, uh, but I'm not going to talk about that use case today. So, uh, also there are a lot of third-party solutions uh, sp specifically designed for funnel analysis. Uh, and let's quickly uh, compare them. So, as far as performance is considered, a uh, third-party solution is definitely faster uh, because it's custom-built, bottom-up uh, for that one specific use case, uh, and we cannot match the performance there uh, with the off-the-shelf uh, tools. Uh, but if you're, uh, consider, if you're concerned about where your data is because of the GDPR or any other reason, uh, with the internal solution, we are not sending data to third parties, which is nice. And as for the flexibility, when we have the internal solution, we can also join to all of our internal data, like to bring more insights to our stakeholders. Uh, and uh, also we can have it on our internal dashboards along with all the other data that our business users are looking at daily. And for the cost, uh, well, that differs for each company, so I'm not really going to cover that, and it differs on the, uh, on the third-party solution you're looking into. Okay, so let's explain what's, uh, what are touch points for us. So let's say we have a happy person planning their next trip, and they want to find some cool things to do in the destination. So they might go to one of the search engines to look for things to do in, let's say, Amsterdam, and hopefully they get to our site. They do some browsing, they fire a lot of events, 
but they maybe don't book yet, they're not ready, and they go maybe to their favorite social platform. They see our ad because we're following them, because they like that, uh, and they come back to us, maybe browse even more, trigger more events, uh, go away again, and hopefully maybe they come directly to us next time, and they do some more browsing, and finally they book something. So in this case, uh, we would have three touch points, which are pointed out by the arrows, and we would use these touch points to split this uh, long user path into three sessions, which we would analyze with our funnels. Uh, the issues that we have here that it's not always easy to determine the touch points, uh, and also because the third-party tools cannot do this, then kind of comparing the data between our internal solution and external solution was really hard, uh, and we had some trust issues with our business users. So unless they are doing analysis specifically on the landing pages, we are not using this to split the funnels, uh, which kind of brought us very close to the numbers we got from the external solution, uh, which brought the trust from our stakeholders, and then everybody was happy. Uh, using our solution, and we could deprecate the external one. Okay, so now let's explain how the filtering of the funnel would work like. So let's assume that we want to see, we want to analyze a five-step funnel for, let's say, events A, B, C, D, and E. So what would the actual user journey look like? So the events that the user would fire on our website might look something like that. So the lowercase letters would represent the events that we are actually not interested in because we have more than 200 events and we only want to analyze five of them. So we're going to ignore them before doing anything. And for the events that we are actually interested in, we want to know if they happened in the defined order. Like in this case, it has to be the order of A, B, C, D, E. Right? Uh, and in this big user path, we are looking for the first uh, appearance of our first event, of the A, and then we want to find the second event, which has to happen after the first, and so on. So this is one of the possible uh, cases. The other also valid case is, maybe we only match the first step. Like, so the next visitor did a lot of things, then he got to the first event that we're interested in, and then he could kind of fire the third event, but because we're missing the second one, we're only matching the, the first event in this use case, right? So we're kind of getting the final visualization here. And let's see uh, some other use cases. So how many, how deep, how far in the funnel did the user go? So this is uh, the ideal case, the most basic one. So luckily the customer here got all the way through our funnel. So it got to the fifth step. In this case, uh, they only got as far as the second step in our funnel. We're ignoring the E because the C and D never happened in this user journey. And in our third case, we're actually matching uh, four steps of our funnel. Here we are ignoring E because it didn't happen after D. Uh, we're still matching D because it did happen after D. So we have A, B, C, we ignore E, and we have a D. So we match four steps of the funnel. So here I would like to point out that if, even if we match only the first step of the funnel, it's still a valid funnel. Right. Okay, so let's uh, dive into the solution. So the first step, uh, because we're concerned about performance. We're going to filter only for the selected events. We don't want to scan more data than is needed. And then the key step is that we're going to concatenate all the events into a in a single session into a string. Right? Uh, but we're not going to concatenate the actual names of the events. We're going to, for each step, we're going to assign an alias. Uh, and we've chosen the letters, so A, B, C. Uh, the reason for this are that it streamlines the, the rest of the query. It also enables us to have multiple events per step. And also we have step-specific filters, right? because we just assign it an alias. And then at the end, we have to compare uh, the generated string, which represents the user journey through our website, 
uh, to the filter specified in our BLA tool to determine if it's a valid uh, funnel and how deep did the customer get inside that funnel. Okay, so let's see how that looks in the code. So this is the case that statement which we use uh, to build the actual string. Uh, as you can see in this case, uh, for our first step, we have chosen uh, two possible events. It's a landing page and home page, and we assign it uh, alias A, if it happens. Uh, for our second step, uh, we have chosen uh, the event product page, but only if uh, the user visit visits the page for the ID 123. And then we assign it uh, the alias B. Uh, and we're using a window function because we want every row in this session to have the same string. Like, so every row will have the entire funnel string uh, so that we can perform further actions uh, on every row that we get. Also, this is actually the select distinct, so we will get one row per each alias in the session. Okay. So let's see what we're doing in the where clause for this. So again, we have to repeat all of the uh, conditions that we were applying also in the case statement. So we have to filter out only the, the events uh, that we want. So again, we have a filter for the event name that we only want the landing page and home page. And then we need the product page for the second step. And the product ID equals one to three. And here we're also adding additional filters that we need. In this case, we also want to filter on date. Uh, because our event table is partitioned by date and event name, uh, so we definitely want to filter on date. Now, this where clause will produce the correct result, uh, but we have two areas marked here because we do have some performance issues. And we can look into the execution plane to see what are the issues. So uh, if you look at the explain plan, uh, first we can see that the partition count is quite high. We have, we're going to scan more than 1,500 partitions. And the event name, uh, which is listed before the partition count, is not one of the three events that we, were, that we have selected. Uh, the good thing is that the partition pruning on the date partition is happening. So we only have data for seven days, but we're scanning 1,500 partitions, which means that we're not having partition pruning on the event name. So let's see how we can fix that. Uh, we had to do two things here. So we had to generate another block in our where clause where we only fil filter on the, the event names. So we have to filter on the event names twice, once where we filter only on the event names. And then we also have the block where we had before. We have event names with, with any additional step-specific filter. Like here for the second step, we, were, we only wanted the product pages where the product ID is one to three. And we also had to move the date filter to the top of our where clause. Uh, because if we didn't do that, we would still get the same uh, explain plan, we would still scan 1,500 uh, partitions. And after doing both of these fixes together, uh, what we get now in the explain plan is that uh, the partition count this time is the expected uh, 21, so we're scanning for seven days and three events. And we also see that we're still keeping the date partition pruning. And in the partition filters now, we also have our event name filter uh, with the correct uh, event names there. Right. OK. Uh, so we're done with the inner part of our query. And this kind of shows the, the sample of rows which are going from the inner query to the outer query. And as we can see, like, uh, we get one row per each alias, and every row for each session has the complete uh, funnel string. Right. Okay. And now let's see how, what, are, what we have to do in the outer query. So first we want to kind of filter 
uh, the rows only to um, to work with the funnels which are valid, and we're checking that in the where clause. And our first version was that we applied uh, regular expressions, so we want to check, like if it's a five-step um, funnel, we want to check that we have uh, the events in the, in the order as it was defined. Uh, and this works correct. Uh, the only issue is this is overkill. It's kind of bad for performance because we are applying a regular expression to millions of rows. And as we mentioned earlier, uh, even if it contains, even, even if the, the user path contains only the first uh, event specified, it's still a valid funnel. So we have changed this from regular expression to a plain locate function where we just check if there is a first uh, step, like the first alias inside the string, uh, and if there is, like we're gonna process the row. And the processing of the row is happening in the select statement, of course. And here we want to determine how far in the funnel uh, the visitor actually got. So for the alias A, we don't have to do anything. We already checked that in the where clause. So anybody who has A got at least to the first step. If the user has uh, the second step, like the B in the string, then we have to check that that B actually happened after the A. And if it did, he got to the second step. And the same for the C, like if we get to the C, we have to check that it happened after a B, which happened after an A, and then the user got to the third step. If none of this was satisfied, then uh, we give it a minus one. Uh, and I'll get to that a bit later. Now, this is also correct, uh, but again, we are executing a lot of regular expressions uh, on a large number of rows, uh, and we want to improve the performance of that. So again, we had to rewrite this using the locate function. So the logic is still the same. It just doesn't look as nice and clean as the first solution. Uh, so again, for the second step, we have to check if the B happened after an A. And for the third step, we have to check if we, have, if we find the C, which happened after B, which happened after the A. Uh, the minus one, if we don't match any of these conditions, uh, is handled in the outermost query, which will be generated by the BI tool. So I will not show it here. Uh, so in, the, in the, the query generated by the BI tool, we're going to filter out anything uh, that has a minus one. And also all of the aggregations and visualizations that's going to be generated by the BI tool. So I'm not really going to cover that now. And this would be the sample of rows which would go into the query generated by uh, the BI tool, right? So for these two users that we have here, like it looks the same as the rows that, were get, uh, that got into the outer query with the additional uh, field uh, step there. So for the first uh, visitor, he got to the third step in the funnel. So the, for the A, we assign it one, the B got the two, and the C ha gets the three. But for the second uh, visitor, uh, he only got to the first step, because here the B happened before the A, so the ordering of the event was not met, uh, so the second row for the second visitor would actually get filtered out and wouldn't get uh, uh, counted uh, in the final query, right? So. Uh, for these two visitors, we would have two visitors in the first step and only one visitor for the second and the third step. Okay, so um, like that's the, the actually the, the basic. The, we covered all the basics of the solution, so it's actually quite simple uh, and elegant to implement. Um, but let's see what else can we add to this to make it more uh, usable to our end users. Uh, so one of the requests we have, we still didn't implement it, uh, but we have, is to enable them to slice the funnel. Uh, because currently they have to, if they want to analyze uh, the funnels uh, by some property which is not global like, uh, like platform, uh, they would have to run multiple queries to get uh, the funnels for value of each of the properties they want to look into. So let's say that they want to slice the funnel based on the product ID, and we might have uh, two visitors 
uh, and the first visitor would, uh, let's say, land on our site, go to the product page. One, uh, maybe add it to cart, then go to the, the product page uh, with the ID two, and maybe they check out uh, both of the products. And then we have another visitor which only goes to the product with ID three, uh, and then checks it out. So if we want to slice the funnel uh, for the product ID, uh, we have to do a few things. So we have to get, of course, the values which satisfy the filter. So it would be the product ID is one, two, and three. And we collect them into, the, into an array with a window function. Uh, but this time, we only want to collect the distinct values. So unlike the funnel string where we want to collect everything in the specific order, here we only care about the distinct values uh, of the property on which we want to do uh, the slicing. Uh, and then in the outer query, uh, we explode uh, this array uh, using the lateral view. Uh, because we can uh, support multiple dimensions. We can have multiple joins to lateral views. And if you use the explode in the select statement, you can only have one. And now we can expose uh, this property as a well dimension, not as a metric to user, and then they can use it to pivot uh, the end result. And in the code, uh, it will look something like this. So on Spark SQL, we would use collect set. Uh, where we would collect uh, the, the product IDs. So if it's one of the one to three, we would collect them into, the, into an array. Uh, and again, we want to make sure that uh, every row in a session contains the full array. And the sample of the rows would look something like this. So our first uh, visitor here uh, would have the product array with the two elements, with the ID one and two, and the second one would only have the, the single element in the array, which is the ID three. And again, uh, the outer query still remains pretty simple. All we need to add is uh, the lateral view uh, join. So we do lateral view outer explode, uh, and we're exploding our array. Uh, and we're going to call the elements of the array, the product ID, which we add to the select statement, right? So um, we could add more lateral views here. Uh, we're not limited by that. Of course, it's important to note that it will multiply the number of rows we're going to get. So maybe we should explain to users not to do it for like 10 dimensions, but they can still do it. Uh, but the important thing is here that they, they have the benefit that they can do it, and they don't have to repeat uh, the multiple step of creating a single funnel and running it three times uh, to get the same result. Uh, also, we would, uh, if we look at the, the sample output, uh, we will double count some visitors, uh, but that's fine. We cannot avoid that. Like, if the one visitor visited uh, multiple product IDs, uh, that's fine. Like even if you run this like three times to get the, the same results, you will again get the double counting. So that's not an issue here. Right. Okay. Uh, so we talked about how we optimize the query uh, as it looks currently, um, and we optimize this the select part and the where part of it, um, but. There's still one part that we didn't touch, and that's our source. So that's our event table. Uh, and currently, we're reading directly for, from it. And as I mentioned, it is a partition table. And as a partition table, we can also consider it uh, as a union of tables, so where each partition is a table. Uh, so maybe we can optimize this by re rewriting from what we're reading, uh, by replacing this table with a series of unions. So let's see how that would look like. So first of all, it wouldn't look as pretty as before. Like we, we definitely get the added complexity of the code here. So for the first step, uh, it's pretty simple. We're still reading only from the events table. We get, uh, we only fetch the events for the first step, uh, and we are again applying the date filter here. So here we're pretty safe. Uh, but then when we get to the next step, um, we actually have to join to the first step. 
uh, because we want to reduce uh, the number, uh, the amount of data that we're reading in, that we're scanning. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're only reading the data for the visitors which actually made the first step. And we also want to make sure that the second step happened after uh, the first step. Um, now maybe, uh, so this is the yellow part, like the on clause. And then in the where clause, we are also applying uh, the conditions for uh, the second step. Like in this case, we want to get the product page event and the product ID 123. And again, we have to apply the date filter to get partition pruning. Right. Um, now, with the changes coming in the Spark 3.0, maybe if you get a small uh, set back from the first step, maybe you would use the dynamic partitioning, if you add also the date into the join, um, but I'm not sure. So the issue here is because we have a lot of joins, uh, it probably, it, it will not probably, it will not significantly speed up uh, this query on Spark. On some other systems, uh, when we were checking, we get more of a speed up. Uh, what you do also get is you are scanning a lot less data. So if you're maybe running this, uh, on a system where your cost is uh, per query and per amount of data which you're scanning. So you would get a bit better performance uh, and less cost, uh, but the price for that is uh, obviously the code complexity, right? Okay. So let's see what that looks currently for our end users. Oops, okay. So this is how it looks in Looker currently. Um, probably can't see much. So uh, on the left, uh, you can see that the, the field list is huge. Even when everything is collapsed, uh, you still can't see everything, like you have to scroll. Uh, so the user experience is not really uh, the best, so it cannot compare with the third-party solutions. Um, I mean, you can filter the list, but still, it's not as nice. And then when you add filters uh, into the filtering section, like for anything uh, that's not really a basic use case, the filtering sec section gets really big. Uh, and because of some weird sorting, like not, uh, not every filter for a specific step is, are like next to each other. So again, user experience, not really the best one. It's kind of hard to see what you actually filtered for. Um, but then again, the visualizations are pretty good, so you can play around with, with the visualizations. There's a lot of options on how you're going to visualize the data, and you always ha can see the, data with, uh, the table with the raw data. Uh, and as for the visualizations, uh, so uh, the line chart here, uh, it's pr actually pretty useful. Uh, it shows how stable your funnel is over time. So if you're running a lot of experiments, uh, in this view, you can see if it affected your funnel at some point, and if your click-through between the steps is deterior de deteriorating or maybe improving. Uh, and at the top uh, on the chart, it's actually how uh, you can split uh, the funnel currently. So here we can split the funnel because the platform doesn't really change uh, within the session, so it's one of the global filters which we can apply and then we can kind of uh, slice the funnel to compare, in this case, Android and iOS. And uh, another uh, nice feature uh, of the tool is that you can actually see the SQL which is generated. Um, it actually has a lot of uh, empty lines uh, because of the way the generation of the query works. Uh, but still, it's useful uh, for data analysts. They can take uh, this query and maybe create a data frame for it on Spark and do some uh, further analysis on it in the code. So it's still a pretty cool feature, and it's good for debugging. Okay. Uh, so how did we ensure the performance uh, in our BI tool? Uh, so we're using the columnar storage for our data, so it, everything is in Parquet file. Uh, so we have to make sure that we're only reading the data that we need. Um, 
and we're only joining to the tables uh, that are needed to support those uh, fields that were chosen. Like, uh, so in a simple uh, use cases, like when you build the normal uh, exploration in the BI tool, you get all of those uh, out of the box, so it's all, of, all taken care of for you. Uh, but when you have a custom query inside it in the BI tool, you, uh, we uh, had to use some additional features uh, to manipulate how the query is actually generated so that we exclude anything that's not needed uh, because um, we have a lot of dimensions which are available uh, to users to select, like a lot of properties, and uh, we don't want to load 50 fields uh, from the table if you only need two or three. Right? And uh, that was pretty much it. So that was our uh, nice and simple solution for uh, funnel analysis. Thank you for enduring. Um, now we have some time for questions. Thank you. We got mics on either side. Um, if you want to ask any questions, please come forward and Hello, thanks for presentation. Uh, so we'd like to understand uh, like logic that you are tracking your, for example, third event in your funnel. Uh, like, do you consider to see the initial page, like the f information from first event in a third one, or you are just getting it by joining it by timestamp or something like that? Sorry, like, if I'm a user, I land it to your application uh, from uh, X page, yeah? Mm -hmm. So I did four different actions, and then I returned from another page, from Y page. So I did third action after landing to your application from X page. How did you track that uh, the third event was done after landing to your application from this or that source or touch point? By source, you mean coming from external site? Um, maybe external or internal, but it doesn't matter. Like the important thing is to understand that I did third event after second event, which was done after first event. But the first event was like a uh, landing event from this touch point. I couldn't okay. ask um, question correctly. Maybe yeah. Uh, I mean, if you did all the actions on on our side, uh, then we know like what you did. Like we uh, have all of those, but if you came from external source, uh, then we can filter on the referrer. Like if you came from Google, we know that you came from Google, for example. So you know that I came, I landed to your page on the first event, but are, like are you tracking the landing page information for all the uh, next events, or are you just joining to first one? Ah, okay. Um, so we handle that uh, in the ETL part. So the touch point, which are mentioned, that's kind of, uh, we have the information where you landed. So you landed on some page. And then in the ETL processing, uh, we consider that as a touch point. And to every consecutive uh, event in that session, we, as we, join, we assign that uh, touch point oh, in yeah. the ETL. So every event, has kind of the current touch point property of it, right? That's how uh, we do it. So we don't have to join on the fly to yeah. determine the touch point. So that's already determined uh, in our ETL. So uh, some kind of data preparation step yes. in order to like transfer all the initial information to upcoming steps. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. every event in our event table has the current touch point, touch point pro property. Like if we were determining that on the fly, it would completely kill the performance. Yeah. Right. Even in the ETL processing, it's pretty hard to determine correctly uh, the current touch point. Uh, that's why we're not always using it. Because yeah, it like some taking issues. into consideration timestamp and something like. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. No problem. Anybody else? There you go. Um, hello, thank you for the amazing presentation. Uh, if you can um, walk me through some numbers related to the size of the data that you are uh, crunching every day to get the aggregated version of the events. Uh, the, the, the funnel is an aggregated uh, version of all of the events. If you can walk me through some uh, the size or maybe the, the time it takes for your ETL to runs, um, since it runs on Spark. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, 
First thing is, we don't do any aggregation. We run on the events as they are. So we're not pre-aggregating anything for the funnels. Right? So it's, we have, we're doing some cleaning in the ETL, so we're removing the bots, uh, but we're not aggregating anything. So our events table, it's raw events. We have everything there. Only thing that we're doing is to make sure that all the events have the same schema, because that's the prerequisite uh, of Parquet. Uh, but also to, to go around the issue of having like, the same schema. Everywhere we also have a field where we store the entire JSON of the event, and we can also filter on that in, in our funnels. Uh, bit impacts the performance, but it's still good. But the funnel table or what you get from the events is an aggregation of events that is then presented to Looker. Yeah, to give yeah I mean, Looker then gets, um, yeah, it gets kind of the aggregated view of it. Um, but I mean, the amount of data that it gets, it depends on the filters, right? It, it varies a lot. Uh, I mean, we have some events which are larger than other, like a landing page event, it's really, really big. Uh, compared to the uh, book action event, which is kind of the last step. It's like only a few percent of the visitors actually check out something, while we have a lot of people landing on the landing page. So how much data you, we actually send to Looker, it, it really differs. Um, okay. But yeah, the landing page event is huge. Like we have a few millions of rows every day. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. <coughs> yeah, so thank you again. My, my question is regarding also related. So you said you don't do any filtering or any aggregation, but for example, I'm a user, I make a click. How do I know or how do you know uh, what else did I did in the past? And also, how often do you keep uh, updated your records? Like is, is stream, batch, if it's batch, how often? Uh, so the events table is updated uh, once a day. Okay. So we are kind of, we are reading the data like continuously, we do use streams, uh, but the processing of it is done in the nightly batch, so we get the new version of the events table uh, once per day. And about history, how do you know a user who makes a click, what, what? what? So you have a, a series of events happening mm -hmm. in the past. Yeah. User makes click or an impression, but you need to have history. How do you keep this history? Uh, well, everything is in the events table, uh, but we don't look. You have to always specify like the, the, the date range, and we're not looking outside of that date, uh, that date range. So if you say, I want to see everything in the last seven days, we don't care about what happened before, before that, like okay. what happened a month ago. We don't care about that. Like it's, it's not going to be included. Oh. Okay. Yeah. okay. We got time for one more question. Go ahead. Uh, I'm curious what kind of, uh, by, the way, by the way, great talk. Uh, I'm curious what kind of overhead you got with uh, regex, so as opposed to actually kind of having your own state machine kind of thing. Uh, like in terms of like the overall thing with all, with all of your I.O., like what, did, you, did you find it to be worth it? Yeah, it was definitely worth it. Like it, it did uh, speed up, like, I mean, even if you cut down five seconds for end users, that's a lot, like, because they don't want to w wait for data. I mean, anyway, they have to wait like 30 seconds, but if they have to wait 60 seconds, um, it's a lot for them. Uh, so yeah, like removing the regex uh, definitely was worth it. Uh, we were looking into performance and it, it did help. Because we did, at some point, we reduced the, the size of the cluster which we were running for the BI tool, so we kind of had to tweak the query a bit more, like when we had, this cluster, si cluster which was double the size, then we didn't really care about it. Uh, but because of the cost, we had to reduce it, so we had to look into it. Thanks. Well, we're out of time. Uh, give a big hand to Zoran again. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Good job. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.